as we approach the end of this course, we are now turning our attention to one of the two types of uh, unique tissues we can find in animals. And that is going to be nervous tissues, which can lead to form uh, nervous systems in some animals. One of the foundations for the nervous system of animals is going to be uh, neurons. And so that is what we're gonna be turning our attention first. Neurons are going to be the basis for any type of a sensory uh, organization in an animal. Neurons are going to be interconnected cells. They're usually long in nature. You can see this illustration of a neuron where you can see the, the neuron body or cell body and that includes the nucleus. And you can also find many of the typical organelles you can find in a eukaryotic cell right around that nucleus. Uh, there's also going to be these dendrites, which are like projections of the body that will help a neuron connect to other neurons. Uh, neurons are also going to have a long process which is going to be known as the axon. This axon is going to be uh, a way of passing uh, electric potentials uh, which carry information from one neuron to another one or for one uh, type of a sensory structure to another part of the nervous system of the animal. Neurons uh, those that are sensory neurons are going to respond to environmental stimuli by producing a nerve impulse. And we're not gonna get into the details of what a nerve impulse is, but it's going to be a, a series of polarization and depolarization of uh, the axon of a nerve cell. By polarization, I mean the development of charges. There's gonna be a more negative charge on the outside of the neuron and a more positive charge on the inside. That's the polarization part. The depolarization part comes when a stimulus like light or sound uh, or taste, depending on what type of a sensory neuron we're looking at, is going to change uh, that polarized state and lead to a depolarization, meaning that quickly those charges will disappear only to be recharged again. The process can be a little bit complicated. It's not too difficult to understand, but it is not the focus uh, of this topic. So just keep in mind that electric potentials are running along the axons of neurons uh, until they reach another neuron or another part of the nervous system of the animal. These uh, electric uh, potentials are going to be self-propagating, meaning that once an electric uh, potential begins on one cell, it's going to continue through another cell and another cell uh, until they reach a final target organ. There are different types of neurons. For example, sensory neurons are going to be those associated with um, uh, sensory organs. They are going to be afferent and they're carrying information towards the central nervous system of an animal if such central nervous system exists. Let's take a look, for example, at this uh, illustration here. Uh, this is a, a simple illustration of a part of the body of a moth. As you may know, moths are these flying insects that usually are seen at nighttime. And there are going to be predators like bats who like to feed on these insects. And so for a moth, like the one we have illustrated over here, it will be very convenient to have a nervous system that would allow it, allow it to detect the sounds produced by bats when bats are hunting. And so the sounds of a bat can be picked up by the ear. Notice the strange location for the ear of a moth. The ear is going to be on the thorax, on the middle part of the body of the animal. Here, a sensor neuron is going to take the vibrations in the ear colliding with the membrane of this animal and will turn it into a, an electric potential. Next, there's going to be an interneuron that is going to be receiving that information taking it over to, uh, this is not a spinal cord because these animals don't have a backbone, but this is going to be like a nerve cord, a central nerve cord for the animal. And so here there's going to be interneurons that can relay information from one part uh, of this um, central nerve cord, which is made up of many of these thoracic ganglia. Ganglia are bundles of nerve cells. And uh, there's going to be eventually a response that the animal must make. If, for example, the sounds of the bat are coming from the right, 
the correct response by this moth should be to fly away from danger, turn to the left. And that decision and the instructions to move away from danger are going to be carried by motor neurons. You can see here the position of a motor neuron. Uh, this is going to be taking information from interneurons that have processed the type of sound that is coming, and now it's instructing the flight muscles of the moth so it can avoid danger, fly away from danger. And so these types of neurons are going to be typically seen uh, in many of the different types of animals we've studied this quarter. Now, something like a nervous system is something that will require many nerve cells. Not only nerve cells, but many times bundles of nerve cells, which we call nerves. That is exactly what a nerve is. A bundle of many axons of many nerve cells that can more easily process information and carry it from one place of the body to another. However, if we look at the most simple of animals, you're going to see that cnidarians do not have nerves. The nerve uh, organization of cnidarians is described as a nerve net. And uh, this is going to be mostly uh, interconnected, single nerve cells. They are not making bundles that can carry information from one part of the body to another. You can see, if I can um, magnify this illustration, that uh, illustration shows the arrangement of nerve cells in a nerve net. Uh, neurons can connect with other neurons using the dendrites in the neuron's body, connecting with the axon terminal ends of adjacent or neighboring uh, neurons. And you can see here more of that extensive nerve net in something like um, an anemone, and you can see also the nerve net uh, inside of the mesoglia of something like a jellyfish. Moving up in complexity, the next more complex nerve organization we're going to see is going to be the radial nervous system of echinoderms. Uh, echinoderms, you have learned, they have a five-part body symmetry, and uh, you will see that there is going to be an organization of nerves coming from a central nerve ring. From here, individual radial nerve tracts are going to be moving and helping coordinate the locomotion of independent arms. And that is going to be an advantage, something that the Nidarians didn't have. I'm moving back one slide. If you look at the type of uh, reactions that these animals can have, it's mostly uh, for something like a jellyfish filling in the gastrovascular cavity and pushing water away. That is how many jellyfish can move in water. Uh, these, for example, can uh, anemones can uh, eject water to make themselves smaller and uh, protect themselves that way. Uh, there is also some uh, limited movement of the tentacles that can bring food in the direction of the mouth. However, in the radial nervous system of echinoderms, there's going to be a more controlled, independent arm movement. Those arms on a sea star, for example, can move in the direction where prey can be found. Uh, these echinoderms, for example, like to feed on mussels, uh, uh, oysters. And so once food is detected, the animal can deliberately move in that direction. The most complex nervous system in animals is going to be the bilaterally symmetrical nervous system, which as you've learned before, is going to be uh, evident in a bilaterally symmetrical animal by cephalization, the concentration of sensory organs on the head region of the animal. Uh, we humans provide a good example of cephalization with uh, visual sensory organs, auditory sensory organs. We have all the chemoreceptors of the mouth uh, and the nose and also the skin. So that concentration of sensory organs is what we call cephalization. Uh, in uh, animals, the bilateral nervous system is going to have a central nervous system, uh, which is going to consist of a brain uh, in longitudinal nerve cords. And that can be seen in something as simple as a flat worm. You can see that there's a very small brain and there's going to be this uh, uh, longitudinal nerve cords that are extending the length of the body of the animal. You can also see some form of a, a basic central nervous system uh, in this leech, which is an annelid. It's, it's a segmented worm 
on the anterior end of the animal. You don't see civilization, but there's still a small brain. And there is going to be this longitudinal nerve cord. There's also going to be a peripheral nervous system. And you can see that there's going to be neurons that sometimes carry information towards the uh, longitudinal nerve cords. That is going to be the transverse nerves you see in something like a flat worm. In this segmented worm, you can see also some of the uh, uh, seg uh, segmental ganglia and some of the projections of those nerves in the animal as well. In annelids and arthropods, uh, the organization is going to be pretty much the same. It is going to get a little more complex when you look at animals like cephalopods and uh, vertebrates, which are going to be uh, participating more in an active lifestyle, interacting with the environment, uh, running away from danger, but also finding prey and capturing prey. And so when you look at a mollusk, like a chiton, the nervous system development is going to be very simple. There's not much of a brain that are going to be these longitudinal nerve cords, but the bundles of nerve cells are not as extensive as you would see in something like a squid. A squid and an octopus, we've learned those uh, as members of the class cephalopoda, a head and foot together. And cephalopods, like the octopus and the squid, are hunters. They also have a sophisticated eye, the most complex eye you can find in all invertebrates. It does have a lens that allows for the formation of images. So you would imagine that an animal like a hunter, such as a squid or an octopus, will have to rely on a greater development of the brain, and you can see that in this illustration, uh, and also ganglia that can help relay information from sensory neurons uh, over to the brain. That's gonna be one of the main functions of ganglia. And again, just to repeat, just to reiterate, uh, nerves are bundles of axons of nerve cells. Ganglia are even greater concentrations of nerve cells that allow for not only moving information more effectively, but also in ganglia, there can be a, 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 an initial level of uh, interpretation of what information coming from the environment means to the animal. And that is going to be all for this short presentation. I will create a few more that will cover the main objectives on this um, nervous systems in animals topic.